So you guys, I'm a little disappointed in the Supreme Court right now. I gotta be honest. One of them clearly did not listen to our video conferencing fails episode. I find that surprising. Did Breyer tell the rest of them to fudge off? Well, in a manner of speaking. <laughs> <laughs> well, so what what happened was during someone's arguments, there was a very clear flushing noise on someone's <laughs> part. No one knows who, but there are many theories. <laughs> Have we considered the possibility that it was opposing counsel trying to rattle Ooh. his counterpart. I like that. Theory. That would be an interesting tactic. Yeah. So we all have our favorite justices and we all have our favorite theory about who the culprit was. Uh, personally, I think it was Ginsburg, but I think the leading candidate is is Breyer. But, you know, speaking of getting flushed down the toilet, I was wondering if we could talk today about <laughs> law students. Uh, <laughs> what a transition, Joe. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Today on Fine Laws, Don't Judge Me, we'll be talking about law students, some of the issues facing them, what they're doing in response to the pandemic, and the suddenly difficult circumstances facing new graduates. Welcome to Fine Laws Don't Judge Me, the podcast about the real life of lawyering. I'm Laura Temme, and once again, I'm joined by our usual crew. We have Andy Leonetti. Hello, Laura. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> Joe Fawbush. Hey, everybody. And Allie Marshall. Good afternoon. Oh, so formal. <laughs> yeah. So how is everybody doing? We'll do a little quick check in here. I'm doing much better this week. Um, That's good know. to hear. How about the rest of you? That's great to hear, Allie. I am, uh, I am <laughs> I still here. I, I am still here, so I am just a little jealous at how upbeat your answer was. Oh, I see. I got it. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, yeah, some days are better than others. And that's really, that's all I have. <laughs> Today's a pretty good day, you know. I think we're all in the same boat. It's good days and bad, and, you know, we're mm -hmm. just trying to get through it like everybody else. That's where I'm at anyway. You got a sharp new home haircut, though, Joe. You must be feeling pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I did. I, I did it myself. It, uh, wow. It was a little scary, I'll be honest. But it doesn't really matter, right? By the time I, anybody else sees it, it'll have grown out to where it was before. So I figured it was a pretty low-risk <laughs> opportunity to, to just take a buzzer to it. Yeah, I dyed my hair. Mm -hmm. It looks terrible. But, again, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> that's such a that's such a common theme um during all of this it was just boredom like i didn't need to <laughs> yeah everybody's at home and just doing wacky stuff to their hair just i don't think we ever realized that the lol nothing matters meme would just take on <laughs> such significance yep <laughs> time is meaningless yeah. everything is whatever and on that uh positive note. <laughs> we're, we're looking ahead a little bit today on how the market is going to change for law students who are graduating this year, people taking the bar exam, and a lot of stuff is very uncertain right now. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, obviously, I never went to law school. So I'm just gonna <laughs> ask you guys to pretend that you're little kids again. And Put yourself in the shoes of some of our graduating law students, because, you know, just like 10 years ago, the class of 2020, and if we're being a little more harshly realistic, most likely the class of 2021 um, is going to be entering a working world at a time of pretty great uncertainty. So far, we've already seen delayed bar exams, distance learning, and some layoffs are maybe on the table. So crew, I want to start us off with a little quick thought exercise. Um, and I'm going to ask the big downer question right now. And I, pro I promise, I promise we'll finish on a lighter note. What um, a great lead. <laughs> yeah. But I want you to put yourself in the shoes of the graduating three L's and the rising two L's. Is that the right terminology? Yeah, you got it. <laughs> hey, look at me. Um, and I would just say, what's the thing that you are the most nervous about right now? Well, I don't have to work too hard to think about kind of what people are going through now. I graduated from law school in 2008. 
So I imagine oh, they had good timing. Yeah, it was. It was great timing. <laughs> so I imagine they're concerned uh, in the same way that I was concerned, which is that you go into law school with a certain job outlook and job prospects, and by the time you've graduated, things suddenly look a lot different. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're worried about getting just that first opportunity because that's the most important thing when you just graduate, right? Once you get that first opportunity, mm -hmm. you can build upon that, but it's, you need that first opportunity. So what people are probably most worried about, what I would most be worried about is just getting enough experience to get my career jump started, you know? And so there's, there's some differences between 2008 and 2020. Um, and, you know, honestly, 2020 may be worse. I don't know. But that's, that same concern is still going to be there about just getting their foot in the door someplace so that they're not stuck in a year or two from now still looking for that first legal job. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, I think it's hard to find your first legal position in a good economy. Um, mm -hmm. So when it's rough, man, it's really rough. So that would be my first concern. Obviously, you have a student loans that are going to start to come due. Yep. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> and those are only increasing by the year. Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely. And what about you, Laura? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think I, I would agree with all of that. And since I'm, I guess the one who came out of law school most recently, yeah, it's, it's tough to, because you've been sort of nose to the grindstone for three years. And then, you know, there are people who already have jobs lined up when they graduate, but a lot of us didn't. And so there's a lot of uncertainty in the best of times to figure out next steps and then taking time off from whatever you're doing to study for the bar exam. And now, you know, bar exams are all over the place right now. Um, yeah. And you've been following this issue pretty closely. Mm -hmm. But I've been trying to. So right now we've seen kind of a whole hodgepodge of actions with the bar exam, with July being right around the corner. Yeah, and that's that's the crazy part of it, is that, I mean, at this point, we're at about half and half as far as jurisdictions that have delayed until the fall and jurisdictions that are going ahead in July. And then you've got some states that are kind of in between where they're offering tests in both the summer and the fall. And it's, uh, yeah, it's it's getting, it's getting a little crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's definitely something that people have to keep an eye on. And there are some jurisdictions that just haven't decided yet. And so I can only imagine um, how much stress that's causing for people because staring down the barrel of the bar exam is bad enough. And so not knowing when you're going to take it, I can only imagine. And applying for law schools, right? Like taking the LSAT. Mm -hmm. um, like I know LSAT's offering an LSAT flex, they call it, where... Um, you know, certain dates, they have it remotely proctored as far as taking the test. So you can at least get an LSAT score to keep that process going. I'm sure law schools are wanting that to happen so that their enrollment doesn't drop mm -hmm. dramatically. But yeah, on both ends of the spectrum, it's really being affected. Yeah, I wanted to ask about that because I learned earlier that the GRE, both the GRE and LSATs have made accommodations for online mm -hmm. testing. And so why is that not being discussed yet with with the bar exams, or I guess it might be discussed, but we just, we haven't heard much about it as an option. Yeah, I, I haven't heard of anyone um, offering online bar exams. Um, one interesting thing that I that I just learned um, is what Louisiana is doing. Um, and they so Louisiana normally has a three day bar exam. Oh, God, I know. First of all, barf. <laughs> I mean, I, I had to do a two day bar exam and that was terrible. Um, and so, yeah, three days is a lot. And but in light of everything that's going on, they have cut it to a single day exam and they're going to hold one in July and one in October. So they're, of course, limiting the scope of the exam and they haven't announced yet what that is going to look like. Um Actually, by the time this episode comes out, that information will probably be available. But yeah, it's it's interesting um, how different jurisdictions are adapting. So with a delayed bar exams, what are the kind of implications for the students in those states beyond? I mean, first thing I can think of is that it's they have to find another way to make money. Mm hmm. Actually, not necessarily. Some states are allowing new graduates to 
practice law under a provisional license where they're going to be able to work without having to first take the bar, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, they should. Yeah. It also raises the question of how necessary the bar exam is to begin with. I was just going to say that. I was just going to say that. I have all kinds of things that I could say about that. Yeah. In in April, the ABA did pass a policy resolution um, basically urging different all the jurisdictions to allow 2019 and 2020 graduates who aren't able to take the bar exam um, to practice under a provisional license like that. I believe several states have formally adopted it. But again, it's this sort of patchwork that nobody really seems to know what's going on. Well, in some states, you can go to their law. What was it, Wisconsin? You can go to law school in Wisconsin and you don't have to take their bar. Um, Yep. As we learned about in For Life, some states (laughs) with the the licensure reciprocity. (laughs) Yes, that's right. (laughs) But like, I'm sure I'm going to get bar examiners knocking on my door telling me I'm wrong. But Nerds. Honestly, <laughs> I I think it's a good time to question how we qualify people to practice law mm-hmm. um, and what we aren't teaching them while we're making them study for the bar exam that actually could serve clients better. So, yeah, absolutely. Onerous licensing requirements have always kind of bugged me. And mm-hmm. so hearing lawyers talk about it now for their own profession kind of makes me giggle at you guys a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so what would your what would your criteria be then if you were in a position to hire one of these grads? Would you want to look at their grades or? Yeah, I think grades. Um, also experience clerking uh, volunteer opportunities. Honestly, mm-hmm. um, there's so many uh, law school clinics run through law schools um, that uh, get their students some really great experience. So I would look at that as well. I guess typical decisions that any hiring manager would make in any job. Right, exactly. Oh, so you're not special. Oh, <laughs> wow. Oh. <laughs> you pulled us right in, Andy. <laughs> you should be a lawyer. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the scary thing. You probably would make a really good one. <laughs> I've been I've been I've been learning from some from some masters. Here. <laughs> so what are some of the benefits, do you think, what are of having these having these kids? No offense to the people that go to law school later in life. I was going to say, I, I, I think you need to know that most law school graduates are in their 30s. Um. <laughs> Not even mid 20s. It, it depends on what school you're talking about. I think when I was in, the average was 28. Yeah, it depends on the school. If, if you're going to go to a, um, an Ivy League school. And or, you know, one of what they call the T14 law schools, then that that road Mm -hmm. is pretty much always right after college. You go to law school and that is true. You either take on six figure debt or mom or dad or an aunt, you know, pay for it. (laughs) Um, You rich benefactor. Yeah. Yeah. My mommy paid for my law school. (laughs) Well, hey, I mean, (laughs) you know, if you can do it, go for it. All right. Let's try not to alienate people. (laughs) Yeah, I, I don't know. It's an investment. But yeah, so it, it does definitely depend. But, you know, if you go to uh, a, a state school, you may find people in, in various walks of life. And some schools are known for uh, trial preparation. Some are, are known for various things. And so it does kind of depend on on where you're at. You know, my the law school that I went to, William Mitchell, was known as more of a trial school. And there were a lot more part-time people, people who were doing it after they had already had a career in something else. So for my law school, there were quite a few older people. Not, you know, old, old, but, you know, they were, yeah, they were in their 30s. They were in their 40s. I feel like we're getting farther away from Andy's question. This this long, funny aside, 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 uh, what, what? How many asides is that? Is that three? Three asides. What I did want to ask was... Well, th- this does present some interesting opportunities for these uh, recent grads without having to take the months of studying for the bar and whatever. What are they? Is there anything that they can teach any new tricks that they can teach the old dogs to help the modern law firm, you know, navigate this situation a little better? Computers? <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, I think I think this well, the, the whole pandemic situation and people having to work from home suddenly when they're not used to it is definitely an opportunity for all industries and especially legal, which for some reason tends to lag behind on tech stuff. Uh, it's a good time to look at how we do business 
and some of the new grads who likely are a little more adept at that kind of thing mm-hmm. definitely have something to offer. You know, going off of that, I wonder if uh, there's a certain shift toward contracting work that's going to be done, mm-hmm. especially by newer grads mm-hmm. looking for work. And, you know, I don't mean to, to stereotype younger generations because I don't think that, you know, younger people are as comfortable with being contractors as maybe sometimes it's made out. But there might be a little bit more comfort for newer grads to shift to a, a more work for hire situation where they're just kind of um, doing the work that needs to be done, but not necessarily mm-hmm. getting the same kind of uh, format that they were used to where it's, you know, we're going to take you on as a, as a junior associate and work with mm-hmm. you over some years. Maybe it's more just like, okay, we're going to sign you up for an agency. And then, you know, through that mm-hmm. agency, you do the work that you can do. So I could see a shift toward more something like that with, with some of the newer graduates, especially considering the job market out there right now. I also expect a lot of people are going to open their own practice right out of law school more than others. I mean, yeah, I, I don't know when, it, when the economy is bad and you want to practice and you want to get experience, Hey, why not hang out, you know, Put out your mm-hmm. shingle. Hang your hang your shingle. Put it out your shingle. What are you doing with your shingle? I don't know. I don't know. Are you hanging it? I think you're hanging a shingle. You're hanging it. There you yeah. go. Yeah. And <laughs> I mean, the the sad thing is, is that we know that at some point, a few months from now, or something, when more of the economic damage from this situation is clear, I think there will be people who need an attorney, and maybe that's a it's a good opportunity for. All right, I don't know how to say this without sound, sounding mean about like. A, a lawyer that they want to pay less money for. And obviously that's probably someone less experienced. Oh, I think that's valid. Is that, that's is valid. that okay? Mm-hmm. Sure, okay. that's valid. Yeah, and actually newer law students might be in a good position because they're coming out with no overhead if they start up their own yep. practice and they, you know, they may be able to just take what they can get with in terms of, you know, I, I can do it your divorce. You know, it's maybe it's not this high asset complex divorce. Maybe it's just a where mm-hmm. they just do it for a little bit less than a established firm would do. I, I absolutely could see that happening. And there will be a lot of demand. That's for sure. I mean. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. For divorce. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, there is work out there. It's just a matter of how lawyers are going to get paid for doing that work. That, mm-hmm. That's a real mm-hmm. problem. Yeah, I think I think people are definitely going to have to get creative. Yeah. And uh, speaking of which, uh, for those lawyers who are looking for those opportunities, Allie, I believe you have some tips for those new to market attorneys out there. I do, Andy, actually have some tips in a, in a do this, not that kind of uh, style approach. Um, and I think, you know, if you're if you're Maybe you've already graduated this month, you're graduating next month. Um, but if you're a law school grad, you know, how do you network if you don't already have a job? Networking is a huge part of it if you haven't already lined something up. Um, I mean, of course, you can straight up apply, but your chances are, are greater if you can network. My least favorite word in the English language. <laughs> I know oh, it's not. Hey, it's the worst. I can come up with lots <laughs> of uncomfortable corporate sayings. Um So, you know, it's stressful during a normal year, and especially if you aren't one of those destined or interested in going to a large law firm, and that was me for sure. You know, I graduated from law school when the job market was rough. It was 2005. It was rougher, obviously, after that, but it it wasn't great then. Um, And at one point, I started keeping my rejection letters just so I'd have something to laugh about on the weekend after crying all week. Um, (laughs) Oh, my God. Oh, God, that's great. I mean, they, you know, they all want you to have experience and, you know, some people clerk in school, but it's it's not the same. It's not enough mm-hmm. um, unless you have a kind of a unique experience. So how do you get that experience if you can't figure out, you know, if you can't figure out how to network or how to get hired in a more traditional sense? So, mm-hmm. again, I'm a strong believer in networking to get your first job out of any school or to any kind of career change in general, um, because practicing law is a lot about relationships. It's social and a lot um, a lot of uh, relationships with other counsel, relationships with clients, etc. So I would say do take some time to think about, you know, three to four things you'd really enjoy doing in practice or types of practice that you would like, or, or maybe it's even the style of practice or the type of people that you'd want to work with or the type of firm, what their values are, as opposed to the work you'd actually do. Um, I would work on creating your elevator speech, even if obviously getting on an elevator with others is pretty much the last thing any of us <laughs> should be doing right now. Um, I would work on your LinkedIn profile 
that's where the majority of attorneys will connect on a professional level um, and then connect. Find who your connections are connected with and maybe that's interesting to you. Um, and then also while you're at it, take some time to clean up your social media profiles and posts because trust me, <laughs> everyone is going to Google you. Um, mm-hmm. reach out to new contacts through your contacts. I already mentioned that, but you know, it's a, it's a helpful way to kind of like, Hey, you know, we have a friend in common or we have a relationship in common. How can we, um, how can we meet and talk or meet virtually? Um, and it can be a great, uh, gateway to your first job. It's a good time to learn how to market yourself and your skills. Um, a lot of firms also don't advertise the need for an associate, but rely on their own networks. So if you make yourself available and let a handful of people in your own circle know that you're looking, that can be helpful. I think you'd need to be st- specific and strategic. It's hard to know exactly what you want to, you know, what you want to do. It's hard to know. Like, what would what mm-hmm. does the practice of bankruptcy actually look like? Um, what does family law look like? But you know, I bet you know what you probably don't want to do. So maybe tailor your message <laughs> as much as you can. And don't just <laughs> have the messaging basically of like, oh, my God, I need a job. I'm desperate. Will you hire me? I mean, that <laughs> doesn't play well. It may be how you feel, but don't project that. Um, also, I think it might be a good time to consider an alternative legal career. What else can you do with your mm-hmm. law, law degree? Um, you can work at Find Law. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> we'd go. love I mean, to. We'd love to have you. I've done both. You can come party with us. Um, and I, there are pros <laughs> and cons to both for sure. Um, also, don't only talk about needing a job or the job, or when you reach out to new contacts, don't only talk about how they might hire you. Talk about, a- ask them questions, find out about their practice. How did they find? You know, how did they get started? How did they end up where they're at? Uh, you might learn something. You might make another great connection that they are like, hey, I, you know, you should talk to so-and-so. Um, that would be a good a good fit for you. Um, but, you know, it's just about developing that rapport. And then um, this one, I think, is going to be actually important on a number of fronts. Volunteer, volunteer, volunteer. Uh, there's no better way to get yourself some great experience as an, a lawyer. I mean, you, obviously, if you have to work pay your bills. That's understandable. But carve some time out to volunteer at legal aid um, through your law school clinic. Even if you don't want to do that thing that you're volunteering in, maybe it's housing court or it's family court or something, you don't want to do that type of work. It's still experience. It's still Mm -hmm. advocacy, um, client representation and all of that. So it's going to help you. And that's the experience that people are looking for. And finally, be patient. Uh, you, you're probably going to have to get a little bit more creative than you would during a, a more typical job market, but it, it, it will be okay. <laughs> I, I could promise that, but I, I mean, I don't know it for sure. I'm, I'm just pretty sure. <laughs> Allie, that's, that was a great uh, transition. What I did want to, want to know is that we are obviously still in Mental Health Month. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. And we talked extensively about it last week, but I think it's always worth uh, rehashing some of these things again. So, uh, I would love to hear some advice from you all about maybe what some silver linings are for these new students who are going to be entering the field at a time of great uncertainty and what they can do to, to get through this. Well, I do think that, you know, sometimes when you say like, it will be okay, uh, you know, people who are going through it think, oh, well, you're being Pollyannish, but it really will be okay. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. where you're at now isn't where you're going to be in five years and 10 years. And, you know, one thing about modern law practice is that it's a lot more mobile than it used to be. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of lateral hiring going on. There's all sorts of ways to open your own law firm, even have a remote law firm. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, there have been kind of shifts in the legal profession over the last decade or so where things are changing anyway. And this pandemic has really accelerated some of those shifts. So if you're staying Mm -hmm. on top of things, if you're working hard, if you're if you're keeping at it, if you're doing the things that Ali was talking about with networking, um, you know, there are ways to move forward and there are ways to build up. So, you know, I, w- I would say just don't throw in the towel. Don't give up. Don't say that, you know, 
I need to go back to school and get a degree in something else. Um, if, if this is really something that you want to do, you can make it work. Yeah, going off of that, I think my my biggest piece of advice is just to get creative if you need to. Um, you know, when I when I first got out of school, I was around this time that year, I was getting ready to start studying for the bar exam. I was bartending in order to pay my bills. Um, and it's it's definitely it's a tough time. And so I think it's it helps to take some time to think about the aspects of law school that you liked and that you were good at, because oftentimes those are the things that will lead you to the the job that's going to be right for you. I mean, that's how I ended up where I am now. I definitely agree with what Joe and Laura said. And I'll, yeah, I mean, just be adaptable. Honestly, one of the things that that the legal profession really needs to get on board with is being adaptable. Um, mm-hmm. So I think we're, we're a little slow <laughs> to change sometimes <laughs> we like the way we do things and I and there are reasons for some of those and that that's fine but I do think we need to be adaptable um because clients need us to be quite frankly um and there's lots of people who need help so there's there's definitely work for attorneys it will look different it will be different but be adaptable those are great points guys and I'll just add in the uh some advice that applies to non-lawyers and lawyers equally even if you have just graduated and you don't have a job lined up yet, you don't have to technically have a job to take a mental health day. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Yeah. This stuff is scary and overwhelming Mm -hmm. and trying to figure out your career can be like a job. And if you need to take Mm -hmm. a day to go for a hike or watch Tiger King or (laughs) drink some beers over Zoom with your friends... Mm-hmm. Not too many beers. Um, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Take you know, care of yourselves. Keep it in moderation here. But if you need to take <laughs> a self care day, please, please do it. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And so, good luck to uh, to the class of 2020 and and 2021. And coming up next, uh, speaking of getting creative in your legal career, Laura has a great story to tell us out of where else. Florida. But first, (laughs) a word from our sponsors. Not having enough time to thoroughly review case notes in a brief before filing isn't an option. Legal professionals like you make the time, even if that means pulling long hours and late nights. Well, Westlaw Edge just released a new feature on QuickCheck that will give you that time back. Quick Check Quotation Analysis is an at-a-glance report that shows differences between case quotes in an uploaded document and the actual case language on Westlaw Edge. Use Quotation Analysis to find weaknesses or inaccuracies in your opponent's documents that you could use to your advantage, and to ensure your quotes are error-free, because accuracy is everything. To learn more, visit tr.com slash quickcheck. All right. As promised, Laura is going to tell us about a spooky career transition for a Florida lawyer. (laughs) Hit the music, please. Thank you, Andy. So, uh, yeah, today I want to talk about a Florida attorney named Daniel Olfelder. He's a real estate attorney based out of Santa Rosa Beach, Florida, who began visiting Florida beaches dressed as the Grim Reaper earlier this month. Uh, saying that their reopening was premature as the state continues battling rising cases of COVID-19. Dressed in an ominous black cloak, hood, and mask, and carrying a scythe, Olfelder yes. traveled to beaches around Walton County, Florida, as part of his macabre protest. <laughs> this is amazing. This is so amazing. It's, I love this It is man. great. And if you have an opportunity, look up the photos. It is. It's really. It's really funny to see someone dressed in full Grim Reaper garb standing on a sunny Florida beach. Um, it, it is truly delightful and uh, an interesting form of protest. <laughs> he just has no time for BS, man. I love it. Like, he's like, nah, yeah. we're going to we're going to be real here. Well, and when I found out he was an attorney, that made me extra happy because I think oh, yeah. people sometimes forget that a lawyers have their own opinions and b lawyers have a sense <laughs> of humor. 
you know? <laughs> and so <laughs> we're I, people. <laughs> we are people. That's the whole point of our podcast. <laughs> That's what I was going to ask. Is there is he running afoul of any sort of bar association? Don't have fun in public rules. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I know of. Although you know, it, it's funny. This isn't the first time that. Uh, that he has made headlines. He actually, while representing a group called Florida Beaches for All in 2019, he got into a little bit of a social media feud with Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee. So Olfelder is a proponent of public beach access and um, Governor Huckabee's beachfront home became part of this legal battle that, that Daniel Olfelder was involved with. And Huckabee ended up filing a bar complaint against this lawyer for Boo. posting about him online. I know. That's a low blow. Well, and, and, and you know, I you're probably going to boo me for doing this, again, but I'm going to bring up Barbara Streisand again because the... Boo. the Boo. Hey, how dare you? Barbara Streisand is a national treasure. You. Don't even start with me on that. Um, but ironically, it was it was actually after Governor Huckabee filed this complaint that the lawyer's social media presence completely exploded. Um, of course. In the in the weeks following that complaint, he went from 400 Twitter followers to over 100,000 in about two weeks. And so now he is taking advantage of that following to get more of the word out about his Grim Reaper protest. So he also has a lot of really great photos on his Twitter page. Yeah. <laughs> Who can we get into a public feud with so oh. that <laughs> our followers will also explode? And what could we fight about? <laughs> Stephen Breyer, <laughs> obviously. We need to. You know, so you want to you want to flip the script on the Barbara Streisand effect? Is that uh-huh. what we're saying? Yep. Did you guys see the tre- Treasury Secretary Steve Min- Mnuchin? Mnuchin. Mnuchin. Yeah. Mnuchin. Mnuchin. Yeah. Whatever. Uh, <laughs> that he he fi- he fired back on Twitter. Oh, Axel to, uh, Rose. Some criticism from the Godfather of Rock and Roll, Axel Rose. Oh, that's yes, I did see that. I was actually impressed with Axl Rose in that. He actually did a pretty good job of uh, getting involved in a Twitter fight. Like, you know, mm-hmm. I wasn't sure what to expect from him, but he actually was pretty good. We could we could probably get someone. We could come up with something. <laughs> <laughs> we just got to work harder to make people mad at us. <laughs> All of our managers are, like, very nervous right now. Yeah, we'd love to hear suggestions from the audience. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Well, or we could just start going out and protesting in fun costumes. Um, you know, True. that was my fa- one of my favorite parts about this story is that as a forever theater kid, there's costumes involved in this. He's committing to the bit and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so, Laura, did beachgoers actually respond to this guy? I mean, like, what was what was the reaction on the beaches? Do you know, did it say uh, from what I've seen, you know, there's a lot of people taking pictures of him and sharing those pictures on social media. Um, I don't think it stopped anyone from uh, from going to the beach. I did hear that. I think it was Naples, Florida. They reopened their beaches for one day and then ended up reclosing them again because they were overcrowded. Um, that was earlier this month. Um, so, yeah, it, it appears that the Grim Reaper has not had the effect that he wanted to have, which is unfortunate. What is the Grim Reaper's name again? Uh, Daniel Olfelder. All right, Olfelder. I'm calling you out. I demand, <laughs> I want I want to see you commit to the bit fully. Oh, God. I mean, whenever, I, I think he has. Whenever <laughs> the next time you are in court, I want oh, you my. in costume, baby. In court? What are you doing? <laughs> no, don't. No. no, I don't want to do that. Yeah. Yeah, we could tweet at him and say that. <laughs> That uh, I don't want to fight with the Grim Reaper. That also I don't either. Like a bad idea. Yeah, I think that's probably enough for today. Before Andy gets us in any, in any social media fights, uh, we'll <laughs> we'll call it a day. We hope everyone out there is staying safe and well. Um, if you would like to start a fight with us, you can email us at finelawpodcasts at tr dot com. Uh, we'd also love to hear from any law student listeners we have about how you're feeling about the upcoming job market. Please take a minute to leave us a review wherever you listen to podcasts. And stay tuned. 